So what we're doing this afternoon is nothing else but a walk through this book. So Divine Marriage from Eden to the End of Days, exact same title, it's not very creative. And uh, so we're going to walk through the highlights of this book. Now this book has a long history, in fact I'll show you a bit of it on the next slide, but first notice this introductory slide, which in the middle you have basically an image of the, 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 the lover and beloved in the Song of Songs. And so here you have your, your nuptial imagery right there in the center, but what is surrounding it? On the bottom uh, left, I guess, you have the Garden of Eden, and so you see the beginning of the story of love that begins in the Garden of Eden. And then, as we know, uh, this is something happened to this divine human of love uh, at, in the Garden of Eden, and namely through sin, right, through the rebellion of Adam and Eve, which led to the beginning of the, the so-called exile of humanity from God. And that was restored with this great redemptive event that we see on the second picture, the revelation of Mount Sinai. And so at this moment of Mount Sinai, we're going to see how that was kind of a betrothal moment in the history of Israel. But Mount Sinai only happened once, right, uh, when they left Egypt and then met God at, at the mountain. So where would God be for the rest of Israelite history? And that's the, that's the next picture of the temple. First the tabernacle in the wilderness and then the temple. That would have been the Holy of Holies, the nuptial chamber where God met with his people. And so what the temple do, it perpetualized its, its uh, in liturgical fashion, the revelation of God in Mount Sinai, where God met his bride through liturgy in the temple. And the temple at the same time anticipated the future consummation of the wedding between God and his people. And that's the last picture we see of, uh, I suppose, the river of life uh, image of the book of Revelation, uh, which the prophets talked about also about this restoration of the marriage in the Messianic age. So that's kind of the roadmap for this entire book. And as I said, it has much of a, a bit of a history, a personal history to, for me. And so here I am in 2012 submitting my dissertation at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which is basically this, uh, this book in, in more expanded, weird version. So if you think this book is kind of looking thick and daunting, well, this is the simplified version. <laughs> so so that's, that was my dissertation, which then turned into First books, it was already published in 2016 as Nuptial Symbolism in Second Temple Writings in New Testament and Rabbinic Literature. So that did not, was not very much modified from that first version, still very academic and also super expensive, published by, by Grill. Not my choice. You know, authors have nothing to say about the prices of those books, so not my fault for the price of this one either, except I thought to, to bring down the price to, to uh, 34 retail. Uh, with the publisher. And so this is the third recension uh, published just last October. I thought after all that work, it would be good to have a semi-popular version out there uh, accessible to uh, anyone who wants to learn about nuptial symbolism and the history of marriage in, in scripture. So as I said, we're going to walk basically through the book, really following the same order as the book. So whether or not you uh, have decided to purchase it, it's going to give you a an overview, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed in the next hour, you know what to do, just get this and then you'll have more time to unpack it. And also get a lot more details than we're able to do in just one hour. So what is basically the structure of this book? What do I do in this book? Um, well, I introduce the marriage between God and his people first, and then there are three major parts. The first one I go through, through the Old Testament, and I show that this nuptial dimension of God's marriage with his people has essentially four critical or key moments in salvation history, which I just mentioned in the last slide. So we see in the very beginning, we see this marriage with creation in the Garden of Eden, and we see that this marriage is broken, and so it needs to be fixed by this great redemptive moment, which is the betrothal of God in Israel and Mount Sinai. And then this is perpetuated in time in the bridal chamber, which is the tabernacle and temple. So liturgically, the marriage is... is uh, extended into time, and then this anticipates the eternal betrothal of the mystical marriage in the Messianic age. So all this is Old Testament stuff read in light of ancient Jewish writings. So I'm drawing from the Old Testament, but I'm also getting a lot from the rabbis, stuff that's not actually spelled out in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible, but the rabbis really expanded by what we call Midrash. You guys familiar with the term Midrash? So it's an ancient Jewish interpretation that kind of fills in the 
and that, and that, that, that the gaps that uh, the things that are left unsaid in the Old Testament, the rabbis really creatively enhance these stories, drawing from their old tradition. So I draw a lot from that in this first part. Now the second part is actually still Old Testament, communion with God through love and wisdom. And so I look specifically at especially two books. I look at the Song of Songs. So the Song of Songs is a very mystifying book in the Old Testament, right? Is it really a sacred book? I mean, it doesn't even mention God in the Song of Songs, right? It's kind of like this erotic love story between this guy and girl. It's barely made it into the canon because the rabbis were kind of like, ah, I don't know if this is really that sacred literature. It's kind of this, you know, romantic poem of sorts, which is almost R-rated. And uh, one rabbi in the uh, second century, Rabbi Akiva, said, God forbid that we would leave the Song of Songs out of the scripture because all the books of scripture are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies of scripture. And so in mystical fashion, the Song of Songs is not just about a guy and a girl who are in love with each other, but it represents um, metaphorically, allegorically, mystically, the love between God and Israel. So I'll get just a little bit into that uh, here this afternoon, but again, there's much more in the book on the rabbinic interpretation of the Song of Songs. Then I go into the mystery of wisdom. We know of Lady Wisdom in the books of Proverbs, Wisdom of Solomon, and the book of Sirach, and we see wisdom as this female figure who courts her, her followers, and we see also kind of similar ideas that this mystical marriage is found in through these four major key, key moments of salvation history. So that's the second part. The third part, we'll cover some of it this afternoon. We see how all this is fulfilled in the New Testament, in uh, not all books of the New Testament, but those you see here on the screen. And so we will look especially at the Gospel of John here this afternoon. We'll go really quickly over some of the Pauline writings, and I'll say a few things about the, the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation. So it covers a lot, as you can see. We just have just a little more than an hour, so we'll try to draw the highlights out of it and see hopefully what God is up to in uh, in this great mystery of his marriage with uh, his people. And uh, let's see, in conclusion, I have to tell you kind of a little anecdote. This epilogue was kind of forced on me. It was not part of the original of my dissertation. Um, so from Divine to Human Marriage, what the, the story went, my previous publisher uh, you know the publisher is supposed to, to edit and, and it's peer-reviewed, so you know you get some feedback and they said, we'd like you to include a feminist perspective on your view of marriage. I mean, we'd like to, uh, and, and if not, we're not going to publish your book. So it's like kind of editorial publisher blackmail. Hopefully it's not recorded. I guess it is recorded. So <laughs> the publisher will remain on the... I guess, well, it's easy to find out. Anyway, just <laughs> delete this part before you... Anyway. So anyway, they, they forced me to add this feminist perspective to... And I was a bit ticked off. It's like, fine, but this is not what I'm doing. I mean, I've done writing my book. Why are you forcing me to add content to it? So I said, okay, fine, you want, I'll give you feminist perspective. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to sandwich it between an Orthodox Jewish perspective and a Catholic theology of the body perspective. And so that's this epilogue where I give three modern perspectives of... Uh, of the, of the divine marriage, how it's applied to human marriage. So Orthodox Jewish perspective, which is very much in continuity with the biblical data. The feminist, I should say really radical feminist perspective, which is completely in, in, uh, in rupture with the, the, the biblical trajectory, and then the Catholic theology of the body, of course, which returns to very biblical uh, view. So that's the fun fact about this epilogue, which I will not get into uh, this afternoon, but so you know where to find it. Okay. All right, so we begin with this first part, God and Israel, divine marriage in the Hebrew Bible. So as I said already, we see this communion of love. We know that the scripture is all about this covenant between God and his people. And if you've heard five minutes of Dr. Han speaking about anything, you know all about covenants already. And so this covenant is represented as a marriage and this bond of love between a man and a woman. And we see that in several books of the Bible. And likewise, the constant... Uh, rupture, the constant tension between God and his people is, of course, because of sin. And so people of infidelity to God is portrayed in the scriptures as a sin harming a conjugal covenant, a type of infidelity, right? So idolatry is portrayed as prostitution, infidelity is adultery, 
And disobedience to the law is not just breaking commandments, but it's abandoning God's spousal love. All right? And isn't that what sin is? It's not just, oh, there's a bunch of rules on paper here that I've just like, like broken this rule. It's like we're breaking hearts and we're breaking relationships and we're breaking this marriage when we sin. Yet, the infidelity of Israel does not affect God's eternal fidelity and faithfulness. So we see that from Genesis to Revelation. So as I said again, this marriage covenant we see pretty much at every point in Scripture, we see it's always connected with these four major stages or events. We have an original prototype, which is broken, which needs some kind of redemptive event. And this redemptive event, you need to stretch it out into history. And how do you do that? Through liturgy, right? And then this liturgy looks backwards to the redemptive events, but it also looks forward to full consolation. So this liturgy is always this type of thing of being between the times, right? Can, can we relate to that? Right? When we, when we go to Mass, right, we're always looking backwards to the cross, to, to the great Paschal mystery that Christ accomplished. But we also say Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Right? When we eat and this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death until he comes. So we're always also looking forward to his second coming. So the very essence of liturgy is very much living between the times, right? Looking backwards, remembering the past, what God has done, but the fullness of redemption is not quite here yet, right? It's here physically, it's here sacramentally, it's here in faith, hope, and love, but it's not completely accomplished because there's still suffering, there's still sin in the world. So let's look at those four stages. In the beginning, the world as wedding. You ever notice with all this talk of love, like Genesis 1 and 2, the word love never appears. The word wedding also does not appear. Marriage doesn't say that. It's almost like more implicit, right? But when you read the rabbis and the midrash, midrashic interpretations of Genesis, it really portrays creation as a cosmic temple. So the creation, the days of creation is like God building a home for his children, right? And Dr. Hahn has talked about this too in many of his books. So we see God building this home, and the combination of creation, of course, is God making man male and female. And we know that they're told to be fruitful and multiply, and a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and shall become one flesh. But we never hear the word love or the word marriage in, in Genesis. It's implied more than explicitly spelled out. So the rabbis, of course, will spell this out. And in fact, it's not just any marriage, but who is the the one officiating at the wedding, it's God himself. And so the rabbis say, Genesis revised this midrash on Genesis, which says, The Holy One blessed thee, he took a cup of blessing and blessed them, for he blesses bridegrooms and adorns brides. If you've been, ever been to any Jewish wedding, the blessings you pronounce over the cup, from which we get the blessing of the cup of mass. And so and not only there was a wedding there, but God is the one who wed Adam and Eve. But not only that, the Midrash says that God even weds the world. So it's not just the marriage of the first couple. And here's this, uh, also from Genesis Rabbah, a parable. You know, the parables of Jesus are very much modeled on these Jewish parables from uh, the, the, the first century and before. So this parable on Genesis says, A king married off his daughter and prepared a marriage canopy in Hebrew is Chupah. And he prepared a home for her. He sought and accused him. So this king said, Oh, my daughter, my daughter, may this marriage canopy always charm me as it charms me at this hour. And so this is a metaphor for the blessed, the Holy One, blessed be he, so God, who said to his world, Oh, my world, my world, may you always charm me as you charm me at this hour. So the daughter becomes a, a sign of, of the world. And so God, who weds his daughter of the world, basically to himself. Isn't it beautiful? So the wedding between Adam and Eve is already like a type, a type of image of God's wedding to the world. This means that Eden is a type of bridal chamber. It's this place where you have this, this marital, this communion, this intimacy between bridegroom and bride. And from how do they do this? The rabbis draw from the Song of Songs. For example, the heart of the Song of Songs, where you see that basically the consolation of the union between lover and beloved where he says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. The rabbi say, as if to say to my bridal chamber, to the place which was my real home originally. For it was not the original home, 
For was not the original home of the Shekhinah, this is the divine presence, in the lower realm, as it says, and he heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Huh, what does this mean? So it's saying that, who has come into his garden, my sister, my bride? This is the divine presence who comes into the garden of Eden, this moment of intimacy, which they connect with the Lord God walking in the garden. So you see what they're doing here? The Lord God walking in the garden is associated now with the, the lover who comes in to uh, my garden, my sister, my bride, which is a kind of thinly veiled euphemism, right, for the consummation of, of the union between the two. And they're saying this is this marriage, this, uh, this mystical reality of this wedding between God and creation here in the Garden of Eden. Cool, isn't it? So the rabbis really thrive on this type of very profound mystical symbolism, taking this story which is so short and concise, okay, the Lord walked in the garden and stuff, what was going on there? And they say, no, this is a deep mystical union that's going on. But as we know, it did not last very long, right? And so we come to Genesis 3, and with the disobedience of sin, so we don't need to go over the, the actual narrative of Genesis 3, but you're all familiar with it, right? So it ends, they sin, they choose to reject God, and this ends with their expulsion from Eden. And so how do the rabbis portray that? As a type of divorce. It's like, you violated my, my fidelity, my, my covenant, and so basically you're going to be, you're going to be cast out as a type of as quasi-divorce, because we know that God doesn't exactly give up on us, right? In fact, he doesn't at all, but still, metaphorically, that's the image that they use. So we see a loss of the light of the Sabbath, this, this moment of communion in the Sabbath, the loss of divine glory in Adam and Eve, and the cherubim who guard at the entrance to the garden. So this great drama of, of separation between God and his bride. And so that's going to last really throughout all the scripture that we're going to see, we know that God does not abandon his people, and we're going to see throughout Genesis, God's going to prepare his people through the patriarchs, right? Well, first there's a flood, and then the patriarchs, and he's going to prepare a moment of restoration of this marriage. Okay, so we see our original prototype broken, and how is that going to be restored, especially with the great covenantal moment at Mount Sinai? <laughs> so how does this kind of covenantal moment begin? We know that Israel ends up, ends up in exile, right? Dr. Healy talked about this this morning. And so this, this slavery, which is really the opposite of love, this bondage, this situation of alienation, this longing for freedom, for love, for communion. So how does this begin? What is this image you see? What's going on here? And it's the Passover, right? So we see them sprinkling the blood on the doorpost. And so the rabbis portray this Passover not just as this weird, bloody killing of a lamb, but as the springtime of love of Israel. And they associate the Passover with this passage from the Song of Songs. One of my favorite, beautiful, right? So the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or young stag. Behold, there he stands behind a wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to him, Arise, my love, my dove, my fair one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of pruning has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. So what did the rabbi say about this? Well, here's the beloved who is among the thorns in Egypt, right? And who's the... The, the beloved, that is the, the beloved woman who is the, the, the rose among thorns, and here is the beloved man who comes leaping over the mountains to do what? To strike the firstborn of Egypt. Ha! Uh, everybody's idea of a romantic, uh, romantic guy, right? He's going to go kill the firstborn of your enemies. And look, he stands behind her walls, gazing in at the windows. So here's God gazing through the windows, right, of the Israelites and making sure that. Uh, those who are under the blood of the Lamb will be protected. And then he invites his love to come out of this winter of slavery and to come into the springtime of love. See what they do? So they take this well-known story of the Passover. Let's bring this together with the Song of Songs. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden our Passover has turned into this beautiful uh, uh, romance instead of, of just uh, kind of a strange, violent uh, Deliverance. I mean, it's not just that. I mean, the Passover is already great in itself, but it injects kind of this this uh, this marital symbolism into there. 
Somebody leave and God takes them out. And we have the Passover, of course, the last of the 10 plagues. And now they come to the Red Sea, right? And more drama there. So they're stuck at the Red Sea, right? They see the Egyptians coming and they're panicking. And what's going to happen? So God's going to intervene, as we know, right? And what do they do about this? Well, they say, the rabbis say, oh, Israel is like a dove fleeing from a hawk, facing a cleft in a rock and a hissing serpent. Wow, where did they get this from? Like the original between being stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? And so on the one hand, you have the sea in front of you, and then you have the Egyptians coming. Oh, my God, we're going to die. What are we going to do? They're going to kill us. We're stuck. We have nowhere to go. So what do the rabbis do? This is what the Song of Song is talking about. Oh, my God, in the cleft of the rock. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. So what's the voice of the beloved? It's Israel saying, ah, we're going to die. Help us. <laughs> so that is your, your beloved sweet voice and her face is lovely. Her good deeds trying to escape the Egyptians. And of course, God shows up and opens up uh, the, the sea with Moses raising his, his staff and they cross. And that leads the way to... Mount Sinai. So that's where the covenant will be formed and where God's going to reveal his divine glory, the glory that was lost in the Garden of Eden. So the rabbis portray this revelation of Mount Sinai as a type of new creation, right? Just think of the Red Sea, right? The opening, the separation of the water and the dry land, right? It's kind of like an echo of the separation of the water and dry land at, at, at the, at the first chapter of Genesis and a remedy to the fall. So the brokenness that came through the, the original sin of the fall of Adam and Eve is not going to be restored here. And now another Midrash says that Mount Sinai is also the day of God's espousals. The Lord came from Sinai to receive Israel as a bridegroom comes forth to meet the bride. And so it's the great moment of God's adoption of Israel, not only as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, but also as a bride. And what is going to be the marriage covenant that God will give Israel, the contract or the covenant, is going to be the, the Torah, right? Beginning with the Decalogue, but the entire Torah is going to be like their betrothal covenant. So does that give you a different twist on uh, the burden of the law? Oh, gosh, I just can't wait for Christ to come and deliver us from this burden of all these commandments that are just uh, so heavy. No, not at all. That the Jews see really the Torah as this great gift of love, of how to live out this covenant of love between God and, and his people. So, they quote the beginning of the Song of Songs, Let him kiss me with kisses kiss of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. What do you think are these kisses for, for the rabbis? They're the commandments. Kiss me, God, with your commandments. I can't have enough of them. And so the, the commandments and the Torah uh, uh, are this expression, these kisses and this love that's better than wine. In fact, the Torah is often compared to wine, like a good wine that brings joy in ebriation because it's a source of, of life, right? So the, the kisses of the Song of Songs are associated with the, the commandments. And Psalm 112, while the king was on his couch, my nara gave forth its fragrance. We'll come back to that when we get to the New Testament. But what is the, who is this king on his couch, according to the Song of Song? This would be basically God in heaven, right, who is uh, receiving this nar, the fragrance of Israel's obedience at Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai, this great romance between God and his, his people. He brought me to the house of wine. Uh, the, I think the song says to his banqueting table, right, which is not the best translation. The Hebrew says, Really, literally, house of wine. Maybe it's like a Baptist version of you know, no alcohol. <laughs> uh, so the banqueting table in Hebrew literally is Beit Hayyim, the house of wine. And his banner over me was love. So again, what's this house of wine? It's Mount Sinai, the place of the revelation where God will um, will adopt his people as his holy nation, but also as his bride. So what's the role of Moses in all this? Well, the rabbis portray, they see Moses as, the Hebrew term is the shoshubin, which is basically a matchmaker or the mediator in the wedding. So Moses is the one who uh, basically mediates between God and Israel, and the Torah is this, in Hebrew it's ketubah, this marriage contract. So that's the guarantee, what guarantees the wedding, uh, the marriage between God and Israel. So fantastic times, right? It's like this 
this overcoming of original sin, and we see the, the, the divine presence that returns uh, at Mount Sinai, and that's gonna be that's gonna last a long time, right? <laughs> Not exactly. So pretty much just a few chapters later, we see, uh-oh, another type of original sin. That's exactly how the rabbis depict the sin of the golden calf. It's like new creation, restoration of the fall, boom. Before you have time to, to, to enjoy it, you see Israel turn away from God, and, and Moses is, you know, tardy on the mountain, and now they make this golden calf and start worshiping this golden calf. So the rabbis portray this as Israel's original sin, and an even more shocking metaphor, they say, this is from the Talmud, shameless is the bride who fornicates in her own bridal canopy. Ouch. So the wedding ceremony is still going on, and the bride must excuse herself to go commit adultery. Ouch. During the ceremony, still. That's how harshly they, they judge the sin of the golden calf. And so what do we do? We see a renewed alienation, right? We see now Israel, who was supposed to be the, uh, the firstborn son and the, the bride of God, and she still is, but now she's seriously wounded the covenant, just like Adam and Eve have done so. And so the rabbis associate the, the Song of Songs 1-5, I'm black but lovely. So the, 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 the woman in the Song of Songs who seems to be a little bit embarrassed about her her, her uh, complexion, or the fact that she was dark in the Middle East, is more of a compliment to be to be light skinned, uh, to be to be suntanned. It's it's considered less lovely than to be light skinned. So she says, "I'm black because of my sin, but still lovely because I'm still loved by God because I repented from that sin." So black in this world and lovely in the world to come. Says the Midrash on the Song of Songs. So this drama continues, right? So now we see another situation of woundedness and alienation. So how are we going to fix that now? And so the next stage is, we're now in chapter 3 of the book. So God's going to come up with a new solution to heal the sin of the golden calf. And that's going to be through the tabernacle first and then much later in the temple. And so the tabernacle, this place, the sanctuary of this place of God's well, will be a remedy to the sin of the golden calf. But it will also be, as I said earlier, this liturgical extension of the Sinai Revelation. So that nuptial moment is going to be carried through into time with the tabernacle, which is kind of like a portable Mount Sinai, right? You can't move the mountain, but you can move this portable tent where you can see the, the, the presence of God dwelling over the Holy of Holies with that pillar of, of, uh, of fire, right? And... So here we have our tabernacle and the rabbis, of course, now we start to get the, the gist of what they're doing. They apply the Song of Songs also to the tabernacle. And so, again, this verse that I just quoted earlier, let my beloved come to his garden. A little wider context, the Song of Songs says, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, and let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits says the woman, and then he says, I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride, and so on. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice, I have eaten my honeycomb. So what do the rabbis say about this? They say, this is Israel inviting God to come and dwell in the tabernacle and partake of the sacrifices. So that Israel is going to offer these sacrifices, either north or south of the altar, that's the north wind and south wind, and God will accept these sacrifices, will take these sacrifices as this invitation for him to come and dwell into the Holy of Holies. And eating them with honeycomb and with wine and milk and wine was, of course, offered with the sacrifices. And so this, this great, beautiful moment of consummation of the union between God and his people becomes now actualized through sacrifice and liturgy, right, through the ministry of the priests. So as I said, this is going to recall Mount Sinai, but it's going to make it present also at every liturgy. Right? You see the parallels with what we do at Mass? Right? The Mass recalls the Paschal mystery, but it also makes it present. We're truly before the sacrifice of Christ at every Mass. So here's another Midrash, which I find very cool, on the Song of Songs. What does the Midrash say? On the day when Moses finished setting up the tabernacle and had anointed it and consecrated it, it was on Israel's bridal day that Moses brought to a conclusion that coming back to earth 
that God had begun in the days of Abraham. What? So the Midrash actually is much longer. I'm not going into all the details, but I've illustrated it. The Midrash says that through every sinful generation, the divine presence removed itself from earth. So going up here in this case is not good, right? So you have, I guess it's really, really small. So you probably can't read it. But first the sin of Adam, and then I can't even see it. Um, oh, you see better than me. So Cain and the generation of Enosh and the generation of the flood, the Tower of Babel, at every stage, the Shekhinah, the divine presence kind of removed herself, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the Egyptians in the days of Abraham. So the divine presence removed herself further and further away from humanity until righteous men, and until righteous Israelites came and gradually brought back the Shekhinah, the divine presence. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, who? Levi. Levi, Kohat, Amram, and Moses. And so through Moses' ministry, through their righteousness, they led to the, the divine presence returning. And when did the divine presence actually fully return? It was when the tabernacle was built. So that, that's time you think that liturgy is maybe, oh, no, not my thing. No, I don't really need that. Uh, keep this in mind that liturgy is the place where the, the divine presence returns, right, and dwells with us. So fast forward many centuries, and the tabernacle will become the temple of Solomon, and the temple will be seen also as a nuptial chamber. So here's another rabbinic commentary on the Song of Songs, quoting Song of Songs 3, verse 11. Go forth and look, O daughters of Zion, King Solomon with the crown, where with his mother crowned him on the day of his espousals, on the day of the joy of his heart. The day of the espousals refers to the day on which the law was given, the day of the joy of his heart was that when the building of the temple was completed, may soon be rebuilt in our days. So the temple too is given a, a marital symbolism that it's the moment when God uh, joined his people and dwelt in the temple. I go in, in the book, in the book, I spend quite some time with the cherubim, which has a really beautiful symbolism. It's a bit shocking actually, so I'll give you a, a, just a little bit of a taste of it here. So to see this beautiful illustration, we I think most of us are familiar that the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies has two had two cherubim over them. So you can see the two little ones, the gold ones right over the cherubim. But in the temple, actually, there were two huge cherubim. There were actually four cherubim on the sides of the of the Ark of the Covenant. And so the, the Old Testament does not tell us a whole lot about these cherubim, what they did. We know that there were cherubim in the Garden of Eden, right? So what happens when the high priest came into the Holy of Holies? It was kind of like returning to the Garden of Eden, to this original place of communion. But what the rabbis do with this, and it's very cool, like I said, it's a bit shocking. They said that during the pilgrim festivals, they would actually open up the Holy of Holies so that people could not go inside, but they could see from afar inside the Holy of Holies. And lo and behold, what do they see inside the Holy of Holies? The curtain would be removed for them, and the cherubim were shown to them, whose bodies were intertwined with one another. And they would say to them, See how you are beloved before God as in love between man and woman. Oh, this is like R rated stuff right there in the Bible. So the, 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 uh, the scriptures don't, don't talk about this. Of course, it would be miraculous, and we don't, you don't need to take this as historical. We don't know. It may have been some kind of miraculous movement of the cherubim, or it might just be a pious legend. So. You don't need to build your whole theology on that. But it's just kind of a cool fact that they they believed, at least, it was a, a tradition in Israel that the cherubim were like moved. And if Israel sins against God, the cherubim would kind of face, face away from each other. And when Israel would be in good favor with God, the cherubim would turn and embrace each other as a sign of God's love for Israel. The things you learn at this Black Biblical Studies Conference. Right? So that's from the, the Talmud, which is the, the greatest compilation of Jewish oral, oral tradition, this tradition of the embracing cherubim. So, all this to say that the temple was the nuptial chamber between God and Israel. So, through Israel's liturgy, and especially the offering of sacrifice, right, the offering of sacrifice was this invitation that God would come and dwell within his temple. Offering the sacrifice, but also keeping of the law, keeping of the commandments, which was the covenant between God and his people. Okay, we come to the fourth stage in the Old Testament. As we said, the, the temple looked backwards to Mount Sinai, but it also looked forward to this consummation of the union. 
So just a few of the prophets use nuptial symbolism, namely Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. And so they express marriage in the covenantal language of creation. So they portray the, the love between God and Israel as marriage that is grounded in God's creation of the world. They also recall the beginning of God's love for Israel as something that happened at the time of the Exodus. This was Israel's youth when they were still uh, relatively innocent. And they also see this spiritual adultery, so this cultic worship of Baal, so these foreign gods will lead to judgment. In other words, worshiping in the temple is the way to enact this communion, but if you pursue other gods, then you're you're opening yourself up for judgment. That's when the cherubim turn away from each other. But the prophets fo focus mostly towards the future, right? So they anticipate this future restored marriage, which would be the return of Israel back to Zion after their exile. So we heard about exile this morning. And I'll give you just a couple of, a few samples of text about this future restoration of the divine marriage. Look at Hosea, for example. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Hosea chapter 2. Very much oriented toward the future, right? Jeremiah 33. There shall be heard again the voice of birth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thanks offerings to the house of the Lord. So the Messianic age will be characterized by the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride that will return. Of course, these were lost during the exile. <coughs> Very rich passage from Isaiah. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be turned forsaken and your land shall no longer be turned desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. So that's actually a Hebrew pun. Married is bibula. What root do you think that comes from? Belula. Same root as Baal. And Baal in Hebrew, you know, it's still a word in modern Hebrew which means husband. It's true. It's true. It also means lords. So your, your landlord would be your Baal Habites. In modern Hebrew, that's exactly what you said. Baal Habites is a landlord. And Baali, my Baal, is my husband. Funny, huh? Uh, funny, that's why y'all have, have to learn Hebrew, uh, because you get so much fun stuff from uh, kind of what happens to biblical Hebrew words and what happens to them in modern Hebrew. So, your land will be married, Be'ula, for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married again, uh, Be'ula. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you, and as the bride will rejoice over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So this eschatological redemption will be this restoration and conservation of the marriage between God and his people. All right, you're all with me still? Okay, so that's four chapters. We come to the second part of the book, and I'm not going to go into any detail of the second part because we want to get to the New Testament. But chapter five is on the Song of Songs as Journey to God. And so the, the, if you read the actual Song of Songs, if you, how many of you have read the Song of Songs at all? Almost all of you, fantastic. Okay. So it has, you know, it's kind of like, it's a garden, a lot of vegetation, you have animals, right? You have, you know, a guy and girl really love each other. This reminds us of another scene. The like Gar Garden of Eden, right? It's kind of this identic setting. So the Song of Songs, a lot of scholars say, this is really portrayed as a type of return to Eden. In, in other words, married love is this return back to Eden. The rabbis believe that the Song of Songs was not just written by Solomon, but it was mystically given to Israel at Mount Sinai. I'm surprised. If Mount Sinai was like the betrothal between God and Israel, it was like mystically in part of Israel at that time. The Song of Songs is also considered the holy holies of Scripture, as I said earlier. And so it's the, the place where you enter God and his, ministry, and his uh, mystery. And the Song of Songs is also anticipates Israel's Final redemption. So here's the quote that I gave you a little bit earlier. The Song of Songs this is the Holy of Holies. So if you look at the way the rabbis interpret this song, you really see it as this sublime uh, mystery reflecting God's love for his people. Okay, I won't say any more about that for now. The mystery of wisdom, I mentioned about lady wisdom. And so in books like Proverbs, Baruch, Sirach, and Wisdom of Solomon, you see, Lady Wisdom, where do you find her? 
Well, she's present at the very beginning of creation. She's co-creating together with God. Does this raise a lot of questions? I mean, what is this wisdom? Is, and clearly she's not like another God, but she's kind of related to God, and she's like God's wisdom, kind of like God's word, God's logos, right? So we're still in the Old Testament. We see how the figure of wisdom really anticipates this idea of this eternal logos, who is somehow God, but not the same as the Father, right? And so wisdom is right there at, at creation, co-creating together with God. She's identified with the eternal Torah given at Mount Sinai. And where do we find her? In the book of Sirach, especially, you see wisdom dwelling in the temple, in the tabernacle of Israel, found through Israel's liturgy. And wisdom will also reign in the Messianic age. Do you see what I'm doing? Do you see those four steps that are exactly what we saw earlier? So wisdom for that creation, when it was broken, wisdom is found in Mount Sinai, given in the Torah, and then she's extended into time through liturgy in the temple, and she's going to be found in the Messianic age as well. So if I'm giving you information overload, just blame it on Dr. Hahn because he was my teacher, and I learned so <laughs> the, the technique of uh, trying to drink from a fire hydrant, teaching as drinking from a fire hydrant. And, um, okay, so that's the middle part of the book. Let's go to the New Testament. Jesus the Bride, we open my marriage in the New Testament. So we're going to revisit some of the ideas that we just talked about. I'm not going to talk much about the Gospel of Matthew. There is some nuptial imagery in Matthew, the parable of the ten virgins, right? We have the parable of the wedding feast, where it seems like Jesus is hinting at the fact that he might be the bridegroom. We have the question on fasting, right? We don't fast while the bridegroom is still with you. And so there's a little bit of nuptial symbolism in there. But I'm going to skip over that and go straight to the Gospel of John, which is full of very rich, very subtle nuptial symbolism. And I think it's one of the longest chapters in, in the book. So what's going on in the Gospel of John? A little quick review. We have the mystery of John the Baptist. We have the famous wedding at Cana, the planting of the temple. We have the conversation with Nicodemus and the whole question of baptism. And we have the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Later in chapter 12, we have the anointing of the feet of Jesus in preparation for his burial. Last Supper, Passion, Death, Passion, Death, and Resurrection. So we'll draw just a few things from the, these, uh, uh, from this narrative from the Gospel of John, and see how we can tie this together with nuptial symbolism. How many times is God, is Jesus called a bridegroom in in the Gospel of John? Does anyone know? No. <laughs> Good try. Uh, just once, actually. So that's why I'm saying it's subtle, because actually, it doesn't really jump out at you that, oh, Jesus brought you in here and there and there. Even at the, the wedding at Cana, you probably all thought of the wedding at Cana, he's not called a bridegroom, right? It's implicit. There's something implicit there, but only in John 3.29 uh, is he called the bridegroom by John the Baptist. It's the only place. But it's enough, because once you're given that hint, you can find a lot more hints in the rest of the book. So Jesus is called many things in the Gospel of John, right? He's the Logos, he's a new Adam, he's a new temple, he is bridegroom, he's king Messiah, he's lamb of God. And so we see a lot of key words, such as there is talk of marriage, right? There's talk of family, there is talk of birth, especially in the discourse at the Last Supper. Glory, rebuilding the temple, Jesus' hour, faith, water, baptism, and all these things, if you look at them carefully, they're all somehow connected to, to marriage and family. So if we begin at the beginning, how does the Gospel of John begin, famously? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So right there in the beginning, in Hebrew, that would be Bereshit. Where else do we hear in the beginning? In the beginning, right? Genesis. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that God, that John begins with this is already a hint, hey, here's, here's a connection with the type of new creation. So we hear of light, so we hear of the, the Holy Spirit, and did you ever notice those seven days in the first chapter of the Gospel of John? It says the next day John the Baptist came, and the next day Jesus met with the disciples, the next day, and on the third day there was a wedding at Cana. Right? So if you add up the days, it adds up to seven days, those first, that first chapter of the Gospel of John. So seven days sounds familiar, right? Sounds like a new creation. So John the Baptist here in this first chapter introduces the bridegroom 
Messiah. He's not yet identified as bridegroom, but we will see how he is later. So Cana, the wedding at Cana seems to take place on the seventh day of a new creation, right? So Cana is, told, is set to happen on the third day when Jesus manifested his glory. So that is looking backward and looking forward. What's on the third day? Wedding at Cana, but also the resurrection. And what's Jesus going to do at the resurrection? He's going to reveal his glory, right? But at Cana, he's already giving a little bit a uh, hint of his glory even though he says to his mother, my hour has not yet come at Cana, but he will still, you know, pull a few tricks out of his, uh, out of his sleeve at that, point, that moment. So the woman, my hour has not yet come. And why is he calling her woman? Have you talked about this in previous Bible studies? Right? So woman, what is this between you and me? And so the woman and the, the, there will be enmity between the woman and the serpent, right? Between her seed and the serpent's seed. And so this alludes to Genesis 3.15. It's ex expanded in Revelation 12 as well. So Jesus' hour at Cana anticipates the hour of his death. And so who provides the wine at Cana? Yeah, the best wine, right? Who provides the wine at Jewish weddings? Right. It's always the bridegroom. So that's why when we have the master of the feast, they run out of wine, the master of the feast says, hey, bring the bridegroom here. So this poor bridegroom, we don't even know who he is. This anonymous bridegroom who's getting married, he's like, well, yeah, I kind of didn't order enough wine, which is massive shame, right, at your own wedding. Like, you're the one in charge, and you totally, you blow, you've totally blown it. This is a serious problem. So the poor bridegroom, he's totally confused, but um, actually at this point, the wine has already been, the water has already been, already even turned into wine, and in the back you have <coughs> another bride who's kind of going, ha ha, yeah, I've got this, right? And so it's very, very subtle, but it implies that the, by the very fact that Jesus provides the wine, it's saying that basically he is the bridegroom. So the wedding at Canaan is like a new creation, right? But it's also something else, and that is not quite as obvious. So as we said, Canaan occurs on the next day, next day, next day, on the third day, on the seventh day, what, hap what else happened on the third day? If you look backwards, back into the Old Testament, at a certain place, people had to pre prepare themselves for the third day. Something happened on the third day. Creation of the world? No, creation of the world is on the seventh day, so it happened at a certain mountain during the Exodus. They, uh, they arrived at Mount Sinai, and in Exodus 19, it says, On the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. Yeah, and even some of the Jewish commentaries say, well, actually, they arrived seven days before, and then the next day, Moses went on the mountain, and the next day, Moses came down on the next day four times, and then prepared himself for on the third day, God will reveal himself at Mount Sinai. What did God reveal at Mount Sinai? His glory, the Ten Commandments, but also his divine glory, he revealed himself. What was Mount Sinai, we said, for the rabbis? A patroller wedding, right? So what's going on with the wedding at Cana? That's also happening in a sequence of four days plus three days, happening on the seventh day, right? So that's the, the Targum, this Aramaic commentary or translation of the Hebrew scriptures. It says the Sinai theophany occurred over a week, four days of sequence, and then on the third day, the Lord revealed his glory. What did Jesus reveal at the wedding of Cana? And he revealed his glory, right? So we have two events, two betrothals, where someone reveals his glory that happens on the third day, which is actually the conclusion of a week of seven days. And what did we say? What did they receive? Okay, God revealed his glory at Sinai, but he also gave them the... Torah, what do we say was a symbol of the Torah? Kisses, Kisses or the house of wine. Ah, coincidence? Mm, maybe, maybe not. It seems like a lot for coincidence, right? So, so the fact that Jesus gives turns water into wine at Cana, and the Torah at Mount Sinai, God revealed the Torah, which is like the good wine, the inebriating wine that brings great joy to the people of Israel. And we know that, so we have this awkward dialogue between Jesus and Mary, right? So they have a wine, woman, what is it between me and you? And then Mary just says to the servants, 
Whatever he says to you, do it. Does that echo something? What did Israel say to God at Mount Sinai? All that the Lord has said, we will do, we will obey. Does that sound somewhat similar? Right? Israel's response to Sinai, all the Lord that has said, we will do, we will obey, we will hear, and we will obey. Right? And so we see something very similar here, whatever he says to you, do it. Mary is echoing the response of Israel at Sinai. He's saying, just obey what's, what he says, and things will do well. Uh, that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so Cana's wine, I also go into a lot of that in the book. Cana's wine represents a type of messianic Torah, right? We have the Torah given, the law given at Mount Sinai, and now we have a new Torah that's given. We have a revelation of divine wisdom. So here's Lady Wisdom, who becomes personified in, in Christ, and it anticipates this eschatological messianic feast. So here's another prophet, the prophet Amos. And what does Amos say about the, the last days, the messianic days? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treasures of grape, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drink with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I'll bring back the captives of my people Israel, then shall build the waste cities. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. Shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. Take that, Baptists. <laughs> Not grape juice. Right? So it looks like they were waiting for this new wine, right, in the Messianic age, the prophet. So Amos is around the 7th or 8th century BC. And so here we have this new Messianic wine at the wedding at Cana by this new bridegroom who gives this new Torah to Israel, right, and this new betrothal with his people. All right, so what happens next? We're still in John chapter 2. Then Jesus reveals himself as new temple, right? You familiar with this passage? Here is the temple. In the synoptics, it's at the end, just before his crucifixion. But in John, it's right at the beginning. And what is going on? He spoke of the temple in his body. So Jesus is not only bridegroom, but he's also temple. Where did God meet Israel in the Old Testament? Where did he meet his bride, as we said, with the cherubim right inside the Holy of Holies? And now... The word became flesh and dwelt in tabernacle among us. So we see Jesus who takes on this bridegroom symbolism, but also this, this temple symbolism. And of course, he's going to be the Lamb of God, so he's also going to be the sacrifice offered. He's both temple, sacrifice, and priest, right? Okay, we zip through to chapter 3. And now chapter 3 is this conversation with Nicodemus where he's talking about, oh, you must be born anew or born again. And there, immediately after this, is talk of baptism. Mm, baptism, going under the water, right, and coming back, back out. And this is where John the Baptist says, He who has the bride to the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full. So John the Baptist is the friend of the bridegroom. He's talking about the coming of the voice of the bridegroom. Didn't we just hear about that? The voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. That was Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah, right? And so John the Baptist is now this shosh being. Now John the Baptist is this mediator, this matchmaker between the bridegroom and the bride. That's why he's not jealous. He's not saying, oh, Jesus is stealing my disciples. Right? So John the Baptist is excited that this is going to happen. And what is this sign of this new covenant, of entrance into the new covenant? It's a birth, right? That sounds a little bit marital as well. So bridegroom and bride are joined through this, this type of new birth. So here is your restoration of the voice of the bridegroom that Jeremiah was talking about. Okay, we're zipping through or going quickly through these, through these chapters, but hopefully it's going to give you a taste for more. So one of my favorite chapters, in fact, that's what made the cover of the book, The Encounter Between Jesus and the Samaritan Woman. So, what? Jesus meets a woman at the well. Right there, this should be like, okay, this should raise some flags. What's going on at wells usually in the biblical world? So, it's basically your pickup bar of the ancient Near East. Right? You want to meet a woman, you go to the well. And when did this happen, for example? Do you remember some examples? 
Moses, yeah, we had a couple in the book of Genesis as well. Abraham's servants, who met, meets Rebecca, who will become Isaac's wife, and most famously Jacob and Rachel, so big romance there. There was a bit of a detour with the Leah story first, but I mean, Jacob was very smitten by, by Rachel, and so what's going on? We see a man meeting a woman at a well, and there's this conversation, and she runs to meet her relatives, to bring her relatives, right? He's invited over, and they have this conversation about wedding and family and so on. So what's going on here? This meeting Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. I'm like, whoa, Jesus, I thought you had some important spiritual stuff to do here. What are you meeting a woman at the well for? Right? And that's why the disciples are a bit scandalized at this. And then think of their conversation. It's like, uh, what? Uh, living water, spring up to everlasting life, give me to drink, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you want to go for a drink? You're right? And it's literally not that different from what what the connotation of that today, right? So this all this talk of drinking, and then she says, well, I'm going to go and get my husbands. But no, you, you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not your husband. So all this talk of living water, well, where do we have these living waters in the Old Testament? There you have it. We had rivers in the Garden of Eden, right? The temple in Ezekiel had a river flowing from the Holy of Holies. Lady Wisdom is often portrayed as streams of water streaming in, in the wilderness, the prophets as well. There's a lot of allusions to kind of this return to the Garden of Eden in and through the temple. But what's the deal with these five husbands that you've had? And the one you have now is not your husband. Hmm, well, the woman is a Samaritan, right? And if you recall the history of the Samaritans, you know they were exiled. And then they returned, and, and they returned, and they worshipped five foreign gods. And they were intermarried with five foreign people, the Samaritans. And then they kind of worshipped the Lord, but it was a very syncretistic cult. In other words, the Lord was their husband, but he was not really their husband. That's why the Jews detested the Samaritans up to the time of Jesus, right? Because they had this syncretistic worship. You know, the Samaritans still exist. You have a small community of a few hundreds in, in Samaria and also in other parts of Israel. And they still celebrated Passover. I was there once when I was living in Israel, where they actually slaughtered a bunch of lambs. And it's kind of this truly open. The Samaritans still exist, much less than the, at the time. There were tens of thousands, and now there are just a few hundreds. So, in any case, this woman becomes a type of the Samaritan people who worshiped, you know, false gods, and they kind of, these five husbands represent these, these false gods. And then what? She goes and calls the, the locals and they invite Jesus to stay there. But what? You now, by this point, it's, this is so similar to the, the story between Jacob and Rachel. Is, is Jesus going to marry this woman? What's going on? Is there going to be a wedding? Is there? Well, what's, what kind of a wedding? What is... Do we see a wedding, a mystical wedding in the Gospel of John? What happens to the Samaritans at the end of John chapter 4? They all come to faith in Jesus. They all come to believe in Jesus. Right? So in other words, a little curveball, right? There's no either way with the Samaritan woman, but all the community comes to faith in Jesus. And what is faith? The previous chapter, we just saw that if you're not born again, if you do not believe in the Son of God, right, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot baptize with water and the Spirit. And now we see this whole community coming to faith. So is there a wedding? Yeah, right? Not a uh, physical wedding, but a mystical wedding going on here. Ah, oh, so rich, right, this gospel. Oh, so much in there. So we fast forward to John chapter 12, uh, one of my favorites. And so here's the episode in Bethany. We see uh, Mary of Bethany, right, the sister of Lazarus. Martha serving. It's not the episode of Martha and Mary. It's another one. But what does Mary do? She takes a pound of costly ointment of pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Where else do we hear about nard? Song of Songs, right? Song 112, while the king is at his table, by spike nard sets forth its fragrance. So do we have, see a king at a table here? And a king reclining at the table, and we see Nara that fills the fragrance of the Nara that fills 
in the house. So what John is doing in this narrative, he's really saying, hey, this is where the Song of Songs is happening here. You, you meet again the bridegroom who is anointed with nard, and uh, you, you see this scent filling the house. So a king on a couch, a woman of nard, and this fragrance, and love also, a, a woman who loves Jesus, right? So another hint at this nuptial mystery in the Gospel of John. And then the hour has come. So the Gospel of John has no institution there, but it has a very long speech. Jesus who washes the feet of his, his disciples. He speaks of, I will prepare a place for, for you in my Father's house. A lot of family language, right? Betrothal language. And so Jesus' death without, and I don't have time to go into the details, but is portrayed, of course, as we know, it's the Paschal sacrifice, but it's also portrayed as a type of messianic wedding. When he says, well, my hour has not yet, has now come. It had not come at the time of the wedding at Cana, but now it has come. And what do we see unique about the Gospel of John? When he dies, his side is pierced and water and blood pour out of his side. So what's that water and blood that alludes to? Another type of birth, right? But it also alludes to what came out of someone's side. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, woman, right? It's often translated as rib, right? We hear it that Eve was created out of, the, out of Adam's rib. But actually, the Hebrew says side. It can mean both rib and side. So it's somewhat more flattering for women. You're not just the rib, but you're actually the whole, the whole one side of Adam, right? When we talk about the two halves, my better half, it's actually more represents more faithfully what the, what the Old Testament said, what Genesis says. So we see this kind of new Eve, of course, that water and blood coming from Jesus' side is also seen as the mystical birth of the church, right? And so it also alludes to these living waters that came out of Eden. We talked about the temple of Ezekiel. We have this birth imagery. And so this marriage symbolism evoking the new Eve taken out of the side of the new Adam. And then, of course, we see God, uh, Jesus, who says, to, to John, behold your mother and behold your son. So we also have kind of the forming of the Messianic family right there between uh, Mary and John. And then after Jesus is, has died, he's involved with myrrh and owlis. And where we hear about these spices, the nuptial Psalm 45, and again, the Song of Songs. Right, so that too, they're usually used in kind of a marital or uh, uh, romantic context. So his death, this gruesome great act of uh, evil and injustice, right? John puts in hints to say that yes, through the suffering, which is a great act of evil, at the same time and mysteriously, there's a great act of love here, and there's the bride who offers himself for his bride on the cross. And we see that confirmed while three days later with the resurrection appearance, and unique to John, we see Mary Magdalene who appears, or not appears, I mean, she comes to the, the tomb, doesn't find Jesus, and then meets this person. So think about this. She arrives while it is still dark. She looks for Jesus in the tomb and says, meets these two figures, right? They had said, they have taken my Lord away, my Lord. I do not know where they have uh, laid him. So she meets these angels, or kind of guardians, and then she turns around and says, she turns around again, she's, she sees Jesus standing there thinking he is the gardener. And then Jesus says to her, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. What does this sound like? Does that recall something? A woman who gets up in the night and looks for the one she loves and meets some guardians and uh, it turns around and turns around the city Right, and then says, I held him and would not let him go. This sounds familiar. So that's Song of Songs, chapter 3. Do you ever think it's strange of it that Jesus said, Do not hold on to me? It doesn't even say that Mary Magdalene held on to him, he just says this. Okay. Yeah, right, right. And so it's, it's a direct echo of, uh, I held him and would not let him go for the Song of Songs. <coughs> Until I had brought him into my mother's house and the chamber of her I conceived me. See how this echoes what Jesus says? I'm not yet ascended to the, the Father. So he's going to take her to the Father's house in the Song of Songs. I want to bring him into my mother's chamber. Right? 
You see that the resurrection appearance, very much the strong, very strong echo of the Song of Songs right there. Now it's cool, isn't it? Okay, so much for the Gospel of John. So we have about nine minutes to go through really quickly. Highlights from the rest of the New Testament. No, just kidding. Uh, just three other books. That's about three minutes each. All right, so St. Paul, actually four books. Okay, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians. That's where we have the whole theology of the body as temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have to exclude the one flesh union with prostitutes. So Paul goes all, into all of his sexual morality. And on what basis? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we move to the person of Christ now, to the Christian believer, right? So where is the temple now? Well, it, it was Christ's body, right? And, and his flesh, but now that he's gone up to the Father, sent the Holy Spirit as paraclete, and now where is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Here we are. It's the church, corp, um, ecclesial is the church, but it's also the individual believer. And so this is why uh, sexuality must be within the framework of the covenant, according to 1 Corinthians. According to 2 Corinthians, we see also the human body, which is portrayed as an earthly tent that awaits its earthly habitation. So 2 Corinthians also has a strong temple symbolism for the, the body of the Christian. But also 2 Corinthians has a really strong nuptial passage in 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul says to the Corinthians, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity and purity that is in Christ. So, who is the Corinthian church for Paul? This pure virgin betrothed to Christ. So, lest there was any doubt, in the Gospel of John, Christ is clearly the, the bridegroom, but who is the bride? It's 2 Corinthians that says it's really the Christian community. And so that's why we are to be as temple where are to be consecrated for our bridegroom. And so we talked about the Shoshbin already a couple times. Moses was the Shoshbin, the matchmaker at Sinai. John the Baptist was the Shoshbin between Jesus and his disciples. So here we need another one. Now Paul is the Shoshbin, and he's the matchmaker between the Corinthian church and Jesus, or between us and Jesus. But the church is compared to Eve, so the church also can be led astray by the serpent, right? We must be vigilant, watch vigilantly our hearts. All right, so that's so much for Corinthians. Okay, the most rich, the richest nuptial passage in the New Testament is, is found in Ephesians 5. We unfortunately don't have much time for that, so that will be for another time. But that's when we see this one flesh union, right? It's very, very rich passage. That's where we see husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and wives submit to your husbands, and the, the Christ offered himself uh, to cleanse his bride with, um, with pure water, right? And he nourishes his bride with, with his, his very own flesh. And there are echoes of the Song of Songs in there. There's strong sacrificial language. So how is love actuated? Through sacrifice. So that already looking at the temple, right? When Israel offered their sacrifices, this is what invited God's presence. And so through human sacrifice, through Christ's sacrifice, he enacts human love. And now how are we to invite divine love into our lives? Also through sacrifice. And where is the highest sacrifice that we join together with? It's a mass, right? So we're joined with Christ's sacrifice. And being joined with Christ's sacrifice in Mass, well, this is where we are able to enact it in human marriage also, where husband loved, husbands love their wives, but Christ loved the church, and wives love their husbands. So that's what Ephesians tells us. Lots of symbolism of sacrifice. In the book, I go into the connections with the Old Testament sacrifices, which some were for the sake of atoning for sins, others were for the sake of enacting communion. And these were offered, these peace offerings, were offered together with bread and wine. And those were the sacrifices for communions. Some of the sacrifices you had to offer first to take care of your sins, right? And then the peace offerings, you could actually eat of the meat together with bread and wine, and that would symbolize this communion with God. And so the sacrifice who is 
holy and without blemish for the sake of making his bride also holy and without blemish. And so that's where Paul quotes from Genesis. He said, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. I speak of Christ and the church. So he's applying Genesis 1 and 2 and applying this to the mystery of the relationship between Christ the bridegroom and the church, his bride. There it is. Ah, we can just talk for an hour about Ephesians 5, but alas. Okay, well, we just about made it. We come to the 12th chapter of the wedding feast of the Lamb in the Apocalypse. And the Bible, of course, ends with a wedding, doesn't it? So after a lot of chaos and confusion and judgment and cups out for it in the book of Revelation, we meet a lamb who was slain, so there again is sacrifice. Right? The line of Judah, who still appears as a lamb who was slain, we meet this mysterious woman crowned with 12 stars, clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, who battles the serpent. So we have an echo of the Garden of Eden here, and this mother of the Messiah, who is clearly the same as the mother of the Messiah in, at when it came up. And at the end, we see the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the loud voice says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. In the last revelation of the Bible, we see the bride of the Lamb who is clothed with the glory of of God, right? this, this extraordinary heavenly wedding where the fullness of the glory of God is revealed. And at the same time, this is the dwelling of God among men, and there's no temple. There's no physical temple because, because the bride herself is this dwelling place of the presence of God. So the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are at his temple. And in the midst of this Revelation, the wedding feast of the Lamb, as in chapter 21, there is a return to Eden and to the tree of life. So the river and the water of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Who do we see here? We have God, we have the Lamb and the river. You see the Trinitarian hint? Right? God, the Lamb, and the river that represents the Holy Spirit. And so these trees of life, so here we are going back to the Garden of Eden, but it's a heavenly Garden of Eden, yielding its fruit for each month. So we see healing, we see the fullness of life, the river of life flowing from the throne of God, and this renewed access to the long-lost tree of life for the healing of the nations. So here we see the consummation of the eternal wedding and this return to the tree of life. So what are we seeing today? A lot of stuff. We basically walk through all the scripture, the highlights of both Old and New Testament. And so we see these four major moments in the salvation history. So in the Old Testament, we see there's a prototype, right? We talk about the Garden of Eden, broken love that is repaired at Mount Sinai, extended into time through the temple, which anticipates the Messianic age, right? So we see these four stages. We move to, there they are. Okay, if we move to the Gospel of John, you see Jesus is the new Adam, right? And Jesus' hour, there's your redemptive moment at the wedding of Cana, which anticipates the crucifixion. So you have your great redemptive moment that reestablishes this communion. Jesus becomes a new temple extended into time, and that's going to be fulfilled by this worship in spirit and in truth that he talks about with the Samaritan woman. Ah, uh, there they are. Okay. When we go to St. Paul, the church is a new Eve. How does the church enter into communion with Christ? Through, we meet through the cross in and through baptism, right? So that we now become the temples of the Holy Spirit, and we await the clothing of a heavenly home when we will join Jesus in heaven. So still four stages. And then we come to the book of Revelation. We meet this woman. We see a return to the tree of life. The redemptive event is the lamb who was slain. And it's extended forever into time through the heavenly temple and the new Jerusalem. And this is the eternal marriage supper of the lamb. 
And there you see the same four stages, Old Testament, the Gospel of John, Paul, and the book of Revelation. It's almost like there's some kind of divine author behind all of this, right? Right? So what do we see here as the last footnote? We see what we come to know as the four senses of Scripture. If you, you're familiar with how to interpret Scripture, the Catechism speaks about this. We have literal sense, we have allegorical sense, Old Testament events fulfilled in Christ, and they're fulfilled in a Christian life, and these events are fulfilled in eternity. And this is exactly what we see, how we see this nuptial symbolism uh, carried out in and throughout Scripture. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you very much for coming.